What's up, everybody? My name is Godzi, and welcome back to another episode of Umaneko When They Cry Answers Arc. Last episode, we continued with Chapter 5 as Delaner uh, officially met Battler, Virgilia, and Beatrice. Well, she already knew Virgilia. She officially met Battler and Beatrice in the Golden Land, and it was cool. And then she went back to her fucking psychopathic master, oh, I, I don't know, manager? What do I call, what really is Erica to Delaner? Like, I guess her summoner? I don't know. Either way, she went back to serve Erica, I guess. So, yeah, I guess master. And uh, <laughs> Erica was pushing Cornelia and Gertrude on the ground because she's... She's like that, and she tried to solve the knock and the letter. Uh, didn't do too well. <laughs> so that's great. Either way, let's get back into where we left off. With the crime in the early morning, we'd completely forgotten about breakfast. So we now had our first meal of the day at a time that could never be called breakfast time. Even Goda's wonderful meal, which had supposedly been in the works since yesterday, provided no comfort. The several empty seats quietly burdened us with a new pain-filled sadness. Then, in the middle of this meal that felt like a vigil, Erica suddenly stood up. Everyone focused on her to see what was the matter. Her expression was somewhere between relief and insanity, as though she'd made some groundbreaking and strange discovery. <sighs> Great dog bark a minute in. Hey, what's up? Are you okay? I've got it! I've got it! Did you think I wouldn't understand? Yes, I've got it. There's no way something that stupid could happen. What do you mean, something that stupid, Erica? Like, <laughs> jumping out the window? Is that the kind of stupid we're talking about? With a hideous expression covered in cold sweat, Erica glared and lashed out at Batler. What <laughs> do you get? There's no way you jumped down from the third floor study. Not one of us saw you fall down and land in the courtyard. <laughs> when you set up the ladder from the courtyard and saw Rudolph go up it to the third story window, you closely observed the construction of the outer wall, and realized that by cleverly using a rain gutter, it might be possible to go down to the courtyard from the third floor window. <laughs> Ma'am, this is a Chili's. You didn't jump down. You used a rain gutter or something and clumsily wriggled down the outer wall. What do you think of my blue truth? Come on, what's your counter-argument? <laughs> my counter-argument? You don't have a counter-argument? Then my truth is valid, right? <laughs> hey, did you see that? Trying to look cool and making it look like he jumped down was all an illusion. He just jumped down and latched onto a rain gutter. <laughs> my argument then was about whether it was possible for Grandfather to escape from the study, right? And it was possible for Grandfather to escape through the window. All I did was prove that. Whether I jumped down or crawled down, that doesn't change anything, does it? Don't try to change the subject! A mere human can't jump down from the third floor! Did you see that? Did you see that? What do you think of my reasoning, my master? Are you tired or something? Just calm down and eat some food. Christ. When he escaped to the courtyard through the window, Batler really did use the rain gutter to crawl down the wall, just like Erica said. Huh. Okay. His hand slipped halfway, and he had fallen from a considerable considerable height. But he had managed to land on his feet. How the fuck would that help Erica? Does she just want to make Batler look stupid or something? Like, crawling down with the rain gutter, that's still not particularly lame, and Kinzo still could have done that, even though he's dead, so whatever. This doesn't help you, Erica. No one had witnessed this, but most likely everyone in the dining hall now except Erica had realized that something like this had happened. Since the very beginning, no one had believed that he'd jumped down from the third floor, third, bleh, third floor window, even if they hadn't witnessed that directly. So they had no clue what Erica was complaining about all of a sudden, and started to whisper, staring at her with cold eyes and dubious faces. You can't counter that, can you? You jumping down has already been denied. My truth is one. My blue truth is valid. My master, please acknowledge this. I'm not incompetent or a disappointment. I will match up to your expectations without fail. So please don't abandon me, my master. Facing someone that might have been... 
Facing someone that might have been somewhere beyond the ceiling, Erica spread her arms and yelled. Then, as if in answer, a massive lightning bolt landed very close by. It was an incredible sound. They could even feel the earth shake. At the same time as that sound, Erica went limp and fell into her seat like a puppet who had just had all its strings cut. Then as the sound of wind and rain slowly filled the room once again, Erica slowly opened her eyes as though recovering from a bout of dizziness. Reset. <laughs> then she continued eating in silence as though nothing had happened. As if she had been acting normally the whole time. Didn't Erica just stand up and sudden stand up suddenly and yell something strange at someone? Automatically, enough to make one doubt their eyes, Erica continued eating quietly as though everything was perfectly normal. When they saw how ordinary she looked, everyone convinced themselves that they were totally worn out, and that they must have just seen some illusion of Erica suddenly yelling. So Erica's sudden transfiguration of a few seconds ago was treated as a daydream, and faded out of everyone's memories. Okay, sure. Erica quietly poked at her salad and muttered in a voice no one could hear. Thank you very much, Great Lady Burncastle. I am Ferudo Erica. I am my master's piece and her double. I almost certainly present you with an incredible tale. Ha 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 ha. Except that was the most useless blue truth in existence. That's right, when it comes to utensils, knives, and- Wait, when it comes to utensils, knives and forks are pretty primitive. Chopsticks are the best. Don't you think chopsticks are the easiest way to eat salad on fucking what planet? Do you eat your soup with chopsticks? Do you eat your cereal with chopsticks? <laughs> yes, and yes, I even drink milk with chopsticks. You are stupid. <laughs> well, everyone? You're supposed to use a fork? And that was the end of the scene, okay. Don't eat salad with chopsticks. Okay? Don't. Like, some things work with chopsticks. Like, anything like, in noodles, that works. Don't eat salad with chopsticks, please. Uh, 12. I can't tell exactly. A little after 12.30, it looks like. So, like, 12.35, probably. Wasn't well, paying too much attention. Hello. Also, my window's open, so if cars are louder, yeah, it's fucking hot, so, yeah. That will return to the guest house at 3 a.m. Then, the rest of you split up about 30 minutes later, right? Yes, that's right. Drowsiness was finally starting to catch up to us. We decided to take a short rest and then start up again. To smoke out the murderer of the first Twilight, Erica closely questioned everyone involved to check their alibis and evidence. To confirm these, she went around the mansion with them, and when needed, took several trips out to the guest house through all the rain. Her vitality was impressive. Though she was an uninvited guest, everyone had long since stopped feeling anything strange about the way she played the detective. Huh. Yeah, this is all just a game setup, isn't it? I just heard knocking outside. I guess my dad's working on the deck or something? It seems Erica is also steadily building her foundation. It's useless. <laughs> That's my line. Whether alibis exist or not, she can't deny our existence. Kinzo escaped through the window and is now one with the mists of Rokanjima. She most certainly won't be able to capture or deny him. When all said and done, perhaps you could say he's escaped to the underside of the chessboard. <laughs> and what does that mean, Gap? In that case, Maybe it would be appropriate to say he's been stowed away. Come to think of it, about those corpses from the first twilight. They've been stowed away too, right? Oh uh, yeah, they have been. <laughs> yes, they've been put away in my darkness, which lies between this world and the next. And that detective wannabe won't be able to find them? Of course she won't. It'd definitely be impossible for a human. Wanna check? Just in case, and we also need to re-examine what Lady Barncastle's goals will be from now on. If you know your enemy, you need not fear the outcome of a hundred battles. If you know the truth, you can win a hundred battles without fighting. <laughs> my my. Gap opened up a large hole in the sky and... 
and had it swallow all of them up. She invited Beato and Ronave to the gap between worlds where she had hidden the corpses. Get it? Gap between worlds? Okay, I'll stop. Okay, yeah, he's definitely working on the deck. That place was nowhere in this world, and existed at no time of this world. In other words, it truly and literally was a place not of this world. In this place, questions such as where is this and what time is it have no meaning. Every single place led to here, but no place could be reached from here. Furthermore, all times connected to this place, but no time could be passed to from here. In short, this place was just what they said it was, the underside of the chessboard. N what the fuck? <laughs> that, that's what I love about living in rural-ass New York. You just hear motorcycles like half a mile away, and then they don't even pass by unless it was a power saw. In which case, I don't know. Everything sounds the same up here. No, perhaps it would be most appropriate to call this the Captured Pile, where pieces that have left the game go. Then, through the pitch black world, a glow like a faint stoplight sh spotlight shone, and five corpses came into view. Yep, the five dead people, except are they really dead? The five pitiful corpses with their necks sliced open had been arranged neatly. Their eyelids were shut and their hands joined. Apparently, even Gap had respect for the dead. Oh my. There are five sacrifices for the first Twilight in this game. Not six? Oh, it's you, teacher! I was worried about where you'd gone. The game has already reached the first Twilight, and as you see, the first victims have appeared. So it's finally time. I'm getting all excited. I see. The you that is here looks to me in high spirits. I'm pleased. <laughs> I've got high spirits and a captivating body. Add in my charming disposition, and you've got my only strong points. <laughs> for some reason, Virgilia praised Beato for being in high spirits. Though Beato was taken aback at such granny-like words coming out of Virgilia's mouth all of a sudden, she pounded her chest and answered. Virgilia had been absent often during this game. She might even have been absent when Batwer solved the epitaph, as well as during the uproar that followed. Apparently, she'd been absent for so many critical points, that she didn't really understand much about what had happened so far in this game. Right now, five corpses have appeared. As you can see, the necks have been slit. George, Jessica, Maria, Rosa, Genji. All five of them had had their necks sliced open by something sharp. Like a blade. The wound opened wider than their mouths, and made it feel as though they'd no longer need their mouths to breathe. Well, cause they're dead. <laughs> I see. So, anyone looking at George, Jessica, Maria, Rosa, or Genji's corpses could confirm at a glance that they are dead. Okay, now, <laughs> okay, that red truth is jarring. Cause that really throws my theory about it being a game for Erica in the water. Or, does, or is there, like, a loophole here? Because it's like, maybe Erica didn't look at the bodies at all. Just assume they were dead. And talk to Nanjo? I don't know. And everyone else lied? Hmm? Red? Well, there's no point in me holding out against you. That's right. At a glance, anyone could confirm that these corpses are dead. So it's absolutely impossible that they're just playing dead. Fuck. <laughs> Then Erica doesn't exist? Or it's some other theory that I haven't thought of. <laughs> Why did Leah use the red? Who knows? However, she is always thinking of what's best for my lady. She probably has some idea in mind that will benefit her. Hmm. But they'd hid the corpses here, specifically so that no one would be able to use the red. However, Ronave was right. Virgilia always thought of Beatrice first. A slightly displeased expression rose to Gap's face, as he saw that the corpses she'd gone to such lengths to hide had now been confirmed dead and red. They didn't say they're dead. They didn't say that. But they might as well have, to some extent. I don't know, I'm still confused. Or skeptical, rather. However, in the end, she remembered that she was only a guest and shrugged. Hmm. 
Why did you have Gap hide the corpses? As to that, since the epitaph has already been solved, this game of mine is different from usual. I now have serving and wait. I now have serving and protecting Natsuhi as my goal. How could con how would concealing their corpses protect Natsuhi? Hmm. Because Erica's closing in on Natsuhi, so hiding them makes it so she has less evidence to close in on her, even though Natsuhi more than likely did not do it. We've more or less figured out what our opponent's moves will be. This is probably a trap meant to corner Natsuhi. Most likely, they'll sort through alibis for the first twilight and find them for everyone except her. Hmm. Last tonight, Natsuhi was the first to leave the family conference, and then rested alone in her room. Unfortunately, she has no alibi whatsoever until the next morning. We've already made Kinzo's existence impossible to deny. However, there is a single move remaining to our enemy that might cancel that out. I see. So they will corner Natsuhi and make her confess that Kenzo doesn't exist. Indeed, the enemy is probably after something like that. By watching the movements of the pieces involved with the family conference, we quickly realized that Natsuhi was isolated, noticed that trap of theirs, and countered with this move. Hmm. The corpses disappear! Everyone has alibis, and no one exists who could have moved them. Not only does this support the claim that a witch exists, it also throws doubt on whether there were actually corpses in the first place, just barely allowing Natsuhi to escape being a suspect. In other words, it's possible for Natsuhi to claim that the sacrifices of the first Twilight were only playing dead. You mean, even though many people confirmed their deaths without fail in the cousin room? Mere confirmation of facts doesn't even approach the red truth. No matter how much everyone claims to have truly witnessed their deaths, the Red Truth doesn't exist in the human world. Because the corpses don't exist, Natsuhi can discount their words as a mistake, some sort of trick, or she can say they were all lying, and it's possible for her to do this over and over to buy time for herself. In the human world, which locks the Red Truth, perpetual check is a valid move. And then this argument with both sides denying the other's claims. Not pretty. True. Wait, did Ron is Ronovay saying this? I think so. True. However, beauty is something to be sought only after victory. When those without victory seek it, it is not but poison. Well, they do say might makes right. <laughs> and don't even and even if I don't think it's beautiful, those Voyager witches will probably like it and say it isn't boring. I see. I've managed to grasp the flow of this game. I imagine it will get quite nasty. We're fully aware of that, and we already know that Natsuhi's probably about to be lured into yet another trap. A trap? Hmm. Hmm, <laughs> indeed. Some Lady Lambda Delta created, who calls himself a man from 19 years ago, has already threatened Natsuhi. She was ordered to go into a closet in a certain guest room in a few minutes, at 1pm, and hide there. Kraus was taken not hostage, so Natsuhi can't resist. I forgot that was at one. <laughs> I see. How relentless. Can you protect her? Of course. After all, Natsuhi isn't the culprit. No matter how much she's treated as the culprit, both the truth and phantoms are on our side. There's no way we'll lose. <laughs> hmm. Shatter. Natsuhi threw her cup of tea to the ground in protest, expressing the anger that flowed throughout her entire body. What do you mean by that? Are you saying you suspect me? Hmm. You told me you left before anyone else, returned to your room, and didn't leave that room until morning. However, if you cannot prove that, it doesn't count as an alibi. Prove? How could I possibly do that? It doesn't matter how. Objectively speaking, it'll all be fine as long as you prove it was impossible for you to commit the crime. Everyone else is cooperating. I want you to stop being so hostile and give me your alibi, along with proof. That's right. Almost the whole night is a blank space and time for Natsuhi. She might have left the conference, saying she wanted to rest before us, then gone to the guest house and attacked George and the others. Please don't be such a fool. Why would I kill George, and on top of that, my own daughter Jessica? Calm down. We're all equally suspicious. 
It's sad, but we all have to prove our innocence. Yeah. We've been thinking frantically about how to prove our alibis for last night, so that we could clear up the suspicion against us. I know you can't like being suspected, Natsuhi. If it frustrates you, then shouldn't your first priority be searching for some way to prove your own innocence? The relatives spoke as though they were all under equal suspicion, but the mood about the place didn't feel so peaceful. Erica was still in the middle of confirming all of the facts, but except for Natsuhi, who was unco uncooperative when it came to proving alibis, everyone else had an alibi that was reasonably credible. Only Natsuhi, who claimed that even being suspected was an insult, was uncooperative with Erika, and her position began to grow more and more perilous. This parlor was no longer a place of comfort for Natsuhi, and the sound of the cup smashing had made that decisive. That's ridiculous! Why must I be suspected when I've lost a daughter? You're maliciously trying to make me look like the culprit just because I went to bed early last night. I cannot stand this humiliation any further. Oh, so what are you going to do about it? Show us some kind of alibi that proves your innocence. As if you could. Give me George back, murderer. Yeah, I think it is a game. Otherwise, Eva would be crying there. Seems like she's just acting. Stop it, Eva. Nazi, you're probably a bit tired too. Same goes for us, of course. Why don't we take it easy for now? Seriously, we're a little too high strung. Aunt Natsuhi, where are you going? Searching for alibis or the culprit would be truly laughable at this point. When the typhoon passes and the police come, everything will be exposed to the light of day. There's no reason whatsoever for us to play at being detectives. Am I wrong, Erica? Generally speaking, you're right. However, I do have the authority to do this. Who gave her that authority? No one asked. It was an authority given by words of power from a higher world, so the pieces weren't even allowed to doubt it. I'm leaving. I have no intention of going along with your pointless questioning before the police come. If you suspect me, feel free to do so. I'm counting on the police to clear away that suspicion. It may be a bit late to mention this, but then again, I guess this happens every time anyway. As usual, the phone couldn't connect to the police. Nasuhi said the police would be coming, but that wasn't exactly true. Strictly speaking, the boat would come tomorrow, and they would use the radio on that boat to contact the police. Well, it's not like I'll let everyone live that long anyway. Oh, who's talking here? Giggle. Natsuhi, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Is this a wooden sword? What am I supposed to do with this? I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps it would be better if we all stayed here. Why not let her? This might make for some very good proof. If Natsuhi gets killed in her own room, that'll be excellent proof of her innocence. Uh, quit it, sis. It's probably best if we all get a bit of rest. Our bodies won't last until tomorrow. If we're going to take a break, we still mustn't let our guards down, got it? We might not make it through tonight, much less tomorrow. And Natsuhi. If you're returning to your room, make sure you lock it tight. Close the windows and shutters too, and stay safe. I don't want to suspect anyone. And more than that, I don't want there to be any more victims. Thank you, Battler. Then I'll return to my room. Goda, you're in charge now. I know this is a horrible situation, but see to it that our guests have everything they need. Yes, madam, I shall do so. And I keep on hitting my microphone, I am sorry. Okay, so yeah, between Erica existing and Erica not existing, <laughs> the red that Lambda Delta said regarding how Erica doesn't exist in the worlds before this one is confusing, but you can construe it either way anyways. Uh, I think she does exist now. I'm almost positive she exists in fact. Or <laughs> I'd like to believe she does, because otherwise this theory would be kind of lame. Um, I think it is a game. I think everyone is just playing a game, and Erica is, well, everyone's created a game, and Erica is the player. It's a fake murder mystery. None of these people are actually dead, I, I think. They might still be, but I think at the very least, they were only planned to fake dead, and Erica is a detective, and she's trying to pin down the culprit. And I think that they're all planning that... Okay, so Krauss only went missing. He never had a body shown. He is 
obviously, assuming that no one actually dies, Kraus and the rest are all still alive. And, well, they're all hiding with Kraus. Probably, yeah, uh, the Kubadorian, or in the woods, or in the garden shed, or something like that, because those are places we have not been before. Maybe the chapel, even. But either way, Kraus, Jessica, George, Maria, Rosa, and Genji, they're all hiding wherever Kraus is. And everyone has set this up so that Natsuhi is the culprit of this game, and that's why Erika is cornering her. Because the way this game is set up, Natsuhi is the quote-unquote culprit. She didn't kill anybody because nobody's dead. It's all just fake. Erika doesn't know it's fake. That's just a theory, though. The other possibility is that Erika doesn't exist. Or Erika does exist and this is all real still. That's possible, but I feel like that's very unlikely given Eva alone. Just how she isn't still crying about George. Like, you think she would be crying about George. You think Natsuhi would still be sh distressed about Jessica. So, yeah. I think Erika exists. Everyone's playing a game. And maybe it's possible that the, the five dead people are actually dead. Who knows? We'll figure it out eventually, maybe. With everyone watching her, Natsuhi left the power work. From their faces, she could tell that they were expecting the classic mystery pattern. That the first person to quarrel and leave the circle would become the next victim. Natsuhi couldn't disobey because of the threat against Kraus who had been taken hostage. Very soon, it would be that promised time. 1 p.m. She was to hide for an hour in the closet of a specific guest room. It was easy to suspect that this bizarre order was a trap to select her as the next sacrifice. She thought of various ways to resist, but all methods would be useless against the culprit who had a hostage and was observing her from close by. So Natsuhi could do nothing but obediently follow that order, and then claim that she'd been forced to do this for her husband's safety. When the promised time had drawn near, Natsuhi had intentionally acted annoyed and smashed the cup on the ground to give her an excuse for slipping out of the parlor. At any rate, no matter how cowardly a trap it may be, I cannot disobey now. I am, I am now the one who carries the burden of the one-winged eagle. Now that my husband, Kraus, has been captured, I must protect it, even if I have to crawl through the mud. Of course, I am prepared to do so. I am Ushiromiya Natsuhi. Even if I am not permitted to wear the one-winged eagle on my clothes, Father gave me permission to bear it in my heart. That is true. But that was probably after Kinzo died, so I don't know. I've managed to get this far by plausibly dashing away in a rage. So far, everything has gone well. Before my eyes was the doorknob of the specified guest room. However, I wonder if it's locked. The servants are normally ordered to lock any unused rooms. What will I do if it's locked? I had dashed away from the others, pretending I was returning to my room. Popping back and asking a servant to unlock this guest room would be obviously suspicious. If I can, I'd like to get this eerie hide-and-seek over with without anyone noticing. In that phone call from the one who claimed to be the man from 19 years ago, he said I would win if no one found out, but lose if anyone did find out. He said my husband would be released whether I won or lost, but as a person with a hostage taken against me, I'd rather not lose. I don't like it at all, but I have to go along with this game. When I softly gripped the doorknob, I could feel that it was unlocked. Did Shannon or Kumasawa forget to lock it after cleaning? Or did that man unlock it in advance? That man couldn't be waiting for me in this room, could he? And then he'll... All that about hide-and-seek might have been a mere excuse. I kept the fact that I was coming here secret, and all the others think I'm resting in my room. If I were to be killed in this situation, it might create a new baffling murder case, like an extension of the one that occurred this morning. That might actually turn out for the better. Perhaps this is a good chance to confront the culprit directly. Nasi had some experience with using Nagi- A uh, Naginata, though only casually. Oh, fuck yeah. Nasi he trained in the art of Chugi. Hell yeah, boy. <laughs> or I guess, girl. <laughs> who are you? I am Master Chugi. <laughs> I will teach you how to use the Naginata. <laughs> what the? <laughs> I don't even know you. Oh, wait. You're not my student. Ah, fuck. I guess I got the wrong address. I'll see you again some other time, if you want some training. Who the fuck was that? 
Unlike Eva, she couldn't brag about being able to hold off any single ruffian indefinitely. As she was now, she had no realistic chance of challenging a man with malicious intent and winning. I wouldn't expect Nazi of all people though to know how to use a Nagi Nada. She readied herself and slowly opened the door. She couldn't just stand around in the corridor and risk being seen by someone. The, the atmosphere inside the guest room was frigid, and she could sense no trace of anyone waiting impatiently for her. All she could hear were the unsettling sounds of the wind and rain. At first, it seemed to prove that there was no one here to threaten her, but soon it only made an uneasy feeling rise up inside her even more strongly than before. The closet was just off to the side of anyone entering the room. Lined up inside it was a set of hangers for coats. This closet, which had nothing hanging in it, was large enough for even an adult to hide in. She softly opened the closet. Of course, there was nothing inside. She would have to hide quietly in here for an hour. The room had a wooden floor, but something like a carpet had been laid in the closet. It seemed sitting down wouldn't be a problem. She had been sure someone would be waiting for her in this room, or that a strange letter would be lying in the closet. In the worst case, she, she had even imagined that her husband's corpse might be inside there. However, none of these things she imagined turned out to be true. The only thing there was a cold guest room, and a lifeless closet that silently urged her to enter. And he told me to hide in here for an hour. He's mocking me. But she does it anyways. Nazi shrugged, turned around, then locked and chained the guest room door. This way, no one will be able to get into this room. In other words, no one will be able to find me for the next hour. I win. What a stupid game of hide-and-seek. This surely must be a total victory in the hide-and-seek game against that mystery man. However, it was such an easy, easy victory it made her feel uneasy. Normally, this would be against the rules of hide-and-seek. Even if she had won, wouldn't this displease the culprit? And now everyone thought she had returned to her room. If they found a room with a chain set, that would make it an impossible closed room to them. Erica had dashed throughout the mansion to confirm alibis or something. If she noticed that the chain was set on this room, there would probably be an uproar that would end in them cutting the chain and searching the room. If that happened, Nazi would be found hiding in the closet right away. It'd be easy to honestly confess as to why she'd been hiding. However, that man had insisted that she not reveal that. If she did talk, she might endanger her husband. Thinking of it that way, setting the chain... No, even the lock might be a bad idea. That's right. This room was unlocked when I came here. If it were to suddenly become locked, it's conceivable that it might catch someone's attention. It's better if I don't do anything unnecessary. That man only told me to hide. So in the end, I have no choice but to do what he says. I hate doing it, but I cannot disobey. I undid those two precious locks, went to the dimly lit closet filled with a smell of old wood, and managed to close the door from the inside. Pitch black. It reminded me of when I was young, when I used to hide somewhere and then surprise my mother. But that peaceful recollection wasn't enough to kill off my anxiety. It really is pitch black. From here, I won't even be able to check my watch to see if an hour has passed. I'll probably need to open the door crack every once in a while to lend enough light for my watch. For now, I'll crouch down here. I thought about clutching my knees, but it hurt my back when I tried. I'm not as young as I used to be. Even though I was made to sit on the floor holding my knees in every PE class as a grade schooler, I now have to struggle just to sit down. This crouching down here for an hour will probably hurt a lot. Huh. Whoosh, wind, woo. Huh. I can't believe I'll be hiding in the darkness for a full hour, with nothing to hear except the wind and rain. Ironically, Nazi had made Jessica do the exact same thing in the past. She had done it when Jessica was a little girl, to scold her for her persistent bad habits and teach her a lesson. Huh. She'd thought that making Jessica stay put in the darkness would sprout a desire to reflect on her mistakes and that, this way, she would understand what she had done wrong. It almost feels like I'm being made to do the same thing, if that's the true purpose of this hide-and-seek. How naive of me. This must be my naivety, the hope that if their goal is to make me repent, nothing will happen here during this hour. Uncertainty and fear of that man's shadow are not what I need right now. Will someone suddenly come to this room, open this closet, 
and do something horrible to me now that I've come here in total secrecy as promised. That's what I should be worrying about. The culprit, or one of his accomplices, is very close by. If they weren't, they wouldn't be able to observe me so thoroughly. I don't want to think it, but it's highly likely that the culprit bought off one of the servants. The culprit had an eerie card with, an with Autumn written on it in my room. That is true, that existed. My personal room is always locked. That trick wouldn't have been possible without a key. Instead of believing that they obtained the key when the servants weren't looking, it's much more realistic to assume that one of the servants lent the culprit a hand. Or one of the servants is a culprit. Or THE culprit. Shannon. <laughs> but how did they know that Autumn is my favorite season? How unsettling. The thought that this mystery man might be peeking into my heart sent goosebumps running across my whole body. It's true that I like Autumn, but I've never said it out loud. I don't think anyone's ever heard me say it. If I asked even my husband what my favorite season is, he would probably be stumped for an answer. No. Just once, I told it to a single person. That's right. Shannon. Well, hey! Uh, oh no. Now that you're saying that, does that mean Shannon isn't the culprit? Because I still think she's the culprit. On an autumn day long ago, I happened to be in a good mood. And I mentioned that Autumn was my favorite of the four seasons. So the culprit, or one of their accomplices, has to be Shannon. Okay. The fact that I like Autumn can only be known by Shannon. In that case, this is clear proof that Shannon is involved. That card with Autumn on it is proof. How outrageous. Even though she served the family for ten years. I trembled and shook with rage. Didn't Kinzo once say that anger is the fastest sedative to cure fear and uncertainty? It's easy to tell the most fearful humans from within a crowd. They're always the first to get angry. I remember him telling me that. So I realized that this anger was a sign that I was actually frightened, and I tried my best to remain calm. However, this is a vital clue for turning things around. Huh. Shannon may not be reliable as a servant, but if she's an accomplice used by that mystery man, this might actually be convenient. A weak-willed girl. If I threaten her, she'll probably spill the name of the mastermind in an instant. I'll secretly tell the police about this. It might become a big clue towards arresting the culprit. That card was probably meant to shock me and get me to do what, she, what he says. But he's actually dug his own grave. I never told anyone except Shannon that I like Autumn. Okay, so this is a red truth in the context of her own mind and memory, right? This is unshakable proof that she's working with the culprit. Though I once thought this time in the closet would crush me with uncertainty and uneasiness, it's actually given me the start of a counterattack. If I wasn't given this time in the darkness, I probably wouldn't have noticed this. I'm almost grateful to the culprit for making up this foolish game. My mood brightened. I still can't guarantee that my husband is safe but I'll definitely get him back and force the culprit to face judgment. I clenched my fist tightly, and further strengthened my resolve to avoid losing this fight at any cost. Oh, rattle, rattle. <laughs> at that time, I heard the sudden sound of someone trying to force the locked door open, and my heart leapt. That... Who is that? Brown. Brown, brown, brown. Brown, brown, brown. Ah, hello there, Hideyoshi. <laughs> oh, it was unlocked. The voice was Hideyoshi's. I heard that quiet voice, as though he was talking to himself, coming from what was probably the hallway. Apparently, he had thought it was locked and tried to unlock it, but it ended up lo but it ended up locking the unlocked door instead. <laughs> Once again, there was the sound of the lock turning, and now the door opened with a faint sound. Why is Hideyoshi in this room? Footsteps that sounded like his came in, and there was the sound of him closing and locking the door behind him. Then came what seemed to be the sound of him setting the chain. Don't tell me, Hideyoshi is the mastermind? Or else an accomplice? Is he planning to do something to me in this room? It would take some time to unlock the door from this side, much less remove the chain. If Hideyoshi doesn't intend to let me escape from here, he won't give me enough time to undo the chain. In that case, if he opens the closet door and sees me crouching here pathetically, just what kind of fearsome words will he say? I don't want to be found. I don't want to be found. I beg you, pass right on by the closet door. Please keep going into the center of the room. 
My head was so filled with a throbbing sound that it felt like it was about to explode, and I almost missed hearing his noisy footsteps. So when I heard a clunking sound coming from the center of the room, I finally realized that he'd passed by the closet and was deeply relieved. Okay. I know he dies, eventually, but... Does he now? And that further implicates Natsuhi? Just in case. In this weather, it's pretty much n night out there anyway. As he whispered, he did something that made a clunking sound. He was probably closing the shutters on the windows. Just in case. In case I try to escape out the window? No, that can't be it. That's right. When I left the part where everyone was talking about possibly taking a break. After all, several murders have occurred. And the weather's bad. There'd be nothing abnormal if someone chose to rest in a guest room here instead of returning to the guest house. In that case, locking up and closing the shutters to guarantee safety is the proper course of action to take. When he finished closing the shutters, there was a thunk as though he'd flopped over on the bed. It was surprising how much of the situation could be grasped just by the sound. What's going on here? Did the man from 19 years ago plan all this out to put me in the same room as Hideyoshi? No, that probably isn't true. He probably planned on me hiding there, but Hideyoshi coming to take a rest here must have been outside the scope of his plan. Thinking about it that way, having him in the room might be odd, but it also might guarantee my own safety. Unlike his wife, Hideyoshi is the kind of person I can talk to. If Eva comes, things will probably get complicated. Maybe I should slip out of this closet now while he's still alone, reveal everything to just him, and ask for help. But if I do that, my husband might be killed. Until my husband is released, I shouldn't do anything rash. Should I go out and talk, or hide in here? Moaning from my headache and biting my lower lip, I resisted the urge to crawl out of here. Even if I talk with Hideyoshi, I don't know where my husband is being held. I'm sure the traitor who is, who's observing me is nearby. Just talking to him won't solve everything. I suspect that Shannon is the traitor, but there's no proof that Gota and the others aren't. It's all useless. <laughs> That's my line! <laughs> I guess leaving here and confessing is too dangerous after all. Eventually I heard a strange, sobbing voice. Whose voice was it? I strained my ears trying to hear that strange voice, and was shocked to discover that it was Hideyoshi weeping. Huh. Hideyoshi, who had lost his only son, was finally able to shed tears and cry, now that he was all alone like this. Dog bark. Thinking that he needed to support Eva in her distress, he acted as though he alone was standing firm. However, he has a good a, uh, as good a right to cry as anyone. And now he's found a place where no one can see his tears. He finally let himself do it. And I've lost my daughter. I haven't seen her corpse with my own eyes, so it still doesn't really feel like she's dead. But if the one who carried her off was the culprit, and he had some repulsive motive for doing it, just thinking about it makes it feel as though my chest will tear itself apart. The reason I'm hiding in here now is that I'm thinking more about my still-living husband than my dead daughter. But if I were given the chance, I'd be wa wailing at the top of my lungs, too. However, I still cannot let myself do that. It isn't because the man from 19 years ago told me to hide. It's because I'm the final head of the Ushromia family. No? <laughs> Batler? <laughs> it's been completely overshadowed by the recent uproar. But last night, Batler found the hidden gold and even gained the head's ring from that mysterious envelope. At the very, very end, when it's all over... I probably won't be able to prevent his ascension as the head. And when everything regarding the distribution of the inheritance is revealed, the Ushiromiya family honor and glory passed down from father will plummet to the earth. So, I am the final head. Batler will probably inherit the remaining wealth of the Ushiromiya family. However, its history and honor will all end with my generation. Therefore, I am the final head. I must not cry. Not yet. Until I get my husband back and avenge my daughter, I will not be allowed to shed tears. In the closet, I silently hung my head as I listened to Hideyoshi's sobs. Who are you? Huh? My heart leapt. I heard a sound that must have been Hideyoshi, who had been probably lying prostrate on the bed, bounding to his feet. Did he notice me? How did you get in here? What's that? Wait a sec. What? Ah! <coughs> He was clearly in a struggle with someone. The culprit. Who on earth could it be? No, it doesn't matter who it is. It's probably the culprit, and they're probably trying to take Hideyoshi's life. Shouldn't I jump out of here and help him? If I can't help him, shouldn't I call for help? No, but if I do something like that, 
I'll be questioned about why I was hiding here. However, if Hideyoshi gets killed like this... No, now isn't the time to be saying that. At this rate, he'll certainly be killed. I'll jump out of here and help him right now. Ah, but if I do that, even if I can save Hideyoshi, I might be abandoning my husband's life. Hideyoshi's life and my husband's life. How sinful it would be to try and weigh those against each other. At that time, there was a loud sound as the door opened and the chain was pulled tight. Someone's trying to open the door despite the chain being set. Dear, it's me. Could you open up? Eva! Dear? What? What's happening? Dear? Open up! Motorcycle gun, man. Fuck you, Vanitas. Open up! Open up, dear! Someone! She opened and closed the door over and over again with all her might, but of course she couldn't snap the chain. Eva called for help in a loud voice and raced through the hallway. Those chains can't be that strong. Kick the door down. By this time, the room had settled back into silence, and that earlier sense of Hideyoshi being in a noisy struggle had disappeared completely. What's going on here? So right now, I'm in the same room as the murderer who killed Hideyoshi. In that case, the culprit should try to escape from the room as soon as possible, so why are they hiding in here? I haven't heard anything. Nothing that might have been the culprit who attacked Hideyoshi running away. No matter how much I strain my ears, I can't sense anyone in the room. In fact, it's so silent that it makes what happened just a second ago feel like an illusion. In other words, does this mean that the culprit is hiding his breath, standing just outside this closet, waiting for me to stumble out? I don't even know what I should be scared of anymore. If only I could just melt away into the darkness of this closet, I mustn't remain in this room any longer. I get the feeling I have more to worry about than just my personal safety. But what should I do? I don't even know if it's a good idea to leave this closet. Eventually, the clamber of many rushing footsteps approached. I'll hold my breath again and melt away into the darkness of the closet. Hmm. Eva dashed back, bringing everyone with her. Goda was gripping some wire cutters to cut the chain with. After trying to open the door again and confirming that the chain was still set, she yelled through the crack in the door. Dear! We're going to open this up! Cut it right now! Yes! Goda stuck the large wire cutter, which looked like it could slice off a whole finger through the crack of the door, and easily severed the chain. Dear! As soon as it was severed, Eva pushed Goda aside and dashed in. The others tried to follow her, but they bumped into Eva, who had fallen to her knees, moaning. So even though they couldn't tell much of what was going on inside the room, they could tell by Eva's moans that they were too late. What the hell? Dear! Dear! Dr. Nanjo! Look at my husband! Quickly! I'll do it right now! You've gotta be kidding me. It's only been about 10 minutes since Uncle Hideyoshi went out saying he wanted to rest. Is there anyone in the bathroom? No! There's no one here! What could have happened? Ah! Dear! Dear! I'm afraid to say that there's nothing I can do. Nanjo stood up, hanging his head sadly. It was only natural. Because anyone, even if they weren't a doctor, would think that at a glance. We're Shannon. We're Cannon, actually. Hideyoshi was lying face down on the bed. And stuck deep into his back was something like a blade with an intricate demonic design on it. Motorcycle gun man. When Eva pulled it out with all her might, they could tell that it wasn't a blade, but some kind of stake. And its sharp tip had penetrated nearly 15 centimeters in. That is six inches, I know math. It had probably dug deep into the lungs. If it had been stuck in any harder, the tip might have even pierced all the way through to the surface of his chest. Hold on, six inches! Okay, I have a ruler uh, right here. Six inches is that much. I'm putting it up to my side. That would go through me. Oh my fucking god. That is not very good. Didn't I tell you to wait for me? Why did you go on alone? Stupid, stupid, stupid! <laughs> the culprit probably waited for us to get careless and split up. That bastard. So he still hasn't had enough blood. There's Shannon. So, he really is hiding somewhere in this mansion, and coming after us? But there's something strange here. The doors and windows to this room are completely sealed. And there's Cannon, 
That's right. The shutters are all shut. And the door chain was set until a second ago. Huh? That That's crazy! In that case, how did the culprit attack Hideyoshi in this room? That is odd. Maybe they threw the stake through the crack in the door. Hideyoshi's bed is in a, t is in a total blind spot from this crack. You couldn't even kill him with a gun. This really is strange. It's a closed room murder. A closed room murder? It's a bit too early to be sure about that. Maybe he removed the ceiling in the bathroom and escaped to the space above it. Or maybe he can close the shutters from outside. The shutters. They didn't budge an inch from the outside. I just went and checked. Erica. And there she is. It's no wonder everything felt so quiet and relaxed. At some point, Erica had split from the group. Just now, she had finally arrived and poked her face in from the hallway. When she heard that a crime had occurred in this room, she had watched everyone rush towards the room, but circled around to the outer wall herself. And she had gone all by herself to check that the shutter was down on the window, that she couldn't do anything with it from the outside, and that there was nothing out of the ordinary. Okay, hold on. If this is... Okay. I'm gonna assume here... If all of these are actual murders, if everyone here is actually legitimately 100% dead, and they died at the points where we actually discovered their bodies, then this murder is a problem. Unless it's Kraus, too obvious though, Kinzo's dead. So, Nazi is already in the closet, she's not the culprit. That would be stupid, that'd be way too obvious. Nanjo... <sighs> No. Like, everyone ran into the room is the problem. Nobody who could have been hiding was hiding. Like, Nazi was already in the room, Nanjo ran into the room, Eva ran into the room, Rudolph ran into the room, Kyrie ran into the room, Batler ran into the room, Kumasawa, Gota, Cannon, Shannon, and even Erica. They all ran into the room, even though Erica doesn't matter, because she's not the culprit anyways, we know this. There is an issue here. That's why I think this is a game Hideyoshi faked his death and everyone's planning on Natsuhi being the culprit in their fake game, which is why she's already hiding in the room, making it an easy mystery game for Erika. I never said they had to be good at this mystery game, because this is a super easy solution. You search the room, you find Natsuhi, she's the one missing. Hey, look, you're the only person who could've. So, yeah, ding dong, ding dong. But the problem lies is if all of these characters are actually dead, because we know, or if Hideyoshi alone is actually dead. If Hideyoshi alone is actually dead, uh, he was lying face down on the bed. It's unthinkable that this was a suicide. Yeah, he did not commit suicide. Meaning, if it wasn't Natsuhi, and Kraus is actually missing, and all these people are actually dead too. Unless one of them faked their deaths, but at, it was mentioned that no one could mistake them for being dead or not. The problem lies in the fact that everyone has an alibi just due to Natsuhi's perspective. Isn't that fun? Because I was thinking, maybe Shannon, but everyone ran into the room. And another thing, Hideyoshi said, who are you? As if he didn't recognize them. Odd. He should recognize them as the issue. Whatever. Um, yeah. And she had gone all by herself to check that the shutter was down on the window, that she couldn't do anything with it from the outside, and that there was nothing out of the ordinary. Is he inside of the room just like usual? There's no need to say it like that. My deepest condolences. So, what's the situation inside the room? The chain was set on the door, so we cut it and entered. And all the windows have the shutters down. They're locked tight from the inside. What are they bickering about in there? Eva was arguing with Nanjo about something. Apparently she wanted to carry the corpse to the parlor. Nanjo tried to calm her, saying that they should leave the crime scene as untouched as possible until the police came. What happened to the other corpses? The culprit carried them off somewhere, right? Maybe that the culprit isn't satisfied with just killing, but intends to do something with the corpses. So no way! No way we're leaving my husband all alone here! Eva does have a point. After all, the victims before now have all been carried away after we were shown their terrible wounds. 
Erica, you'd probably like to preserve the crime scene, but could you just let this one slide? Wait. You'd probably like to preserve the crime scene, but could you just let this one slide? Do whatever you want. All I'm interested in is the fact that a closed room has appeared that's much more serious than Kinzo's study. I have no interest in corpses, so do as you please. So, she's not looking at the body. I think it's a game. Bower's expression was clearly unhappy, but she ignored him completely. Feel free to carry that corpse out any time. Or am I in the way? But wait, hold on. If this is all a game, then what's the point? Wait, I was told multiple times. Basically, nothing written in Umaneko is pointless to the overall story. So, what would be the point of this chapter if no one's actually dead? I mean, I guess the introduction of characters like Delaner and Erica, and the introduction of the uh, Nox Commandments, which actually is a real thing, I looked them up, and some of them are kind of obvious, others aren't really. Uh, there's stuff like, the culprit must be someone who was introduced early into the story, which means one of the 18. Fucking duh. It wouldn't be Erica, it wouldn't be Gap. It said it can't be anything supernatural, so it's not magic. There's a real answer. I don't remember all of them. Those are just some of them. Uh, one in particular was pretty interesting, though. Uh, I was told Umineko follows these rules. Higurashi doesn't, so that explains the uh, Hinamizawa syndrome thing. But one of them was just like... The culprit, or anybody rather, cannot disguise themselves as anyone else without there being proof that this happened. So, uh, me confused in that case. Feel free to carry that corpse out any time, or am I in the way? Erica backed away from the door to open a path. She showed no trace of any sadness for the dead. Her eyes simply blazed with thoughts of this closed room murder that had appeared. In any event, the great detective had given her permission. Eva and some others wrapped Hideyoshi up in the sheets, and Gota and Rudolph carried him out. The sheets were quickly stained red. It was so painful to see that Shannon and Kumasawa stripped the blanket off the bed to further cover the corpse. Hey, out of the way. Yes, I am out of the way. Let's go to the parlor. Yes! Dear! Dear! <laughs> Listen up, everyone. From now on, we'll always move as a group. You must not let yourself be isolated. When the culprit attacked Genji, he probably got a master key. It's clear that even locking up will no longer make you safe. But even if the chain was set, how did they do it? It's impossible. The shutters and the chain were firmly set. Even with a master key, it'd imp be impossible to force your way into that room. Is it not possible that Hideyoshi set the chain after he was killed, and, or after he was stabbed, and the murderer left? But then I guess there would be blood in front of the door. If there was only blood on the bed, that wouldn't make sense. Not to mention, it wouldn't make sense that Hideyoshi would fucking put the chain on the door. Unless the culprit was hiding in there anyways. And he locked it with his dying breath to make the culprit basically be like, Ah, oh, fuck, I'm fucked. <laughs> but everyone entered, so, other than Natsuhi, and she's not the culprit, so I don't know. Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> I just knocked the shit out of my pop filter. I've been doing that a lot. It must have been Beatrice's doing! Oh, There's no way Beatrice did this. The epitaph has been solved, so there shouldn't be any more reason to hold the ceremony. Of course we can't understand it. This would be impossible for anyone except a witch. Impossible for anyone except a witch, you say? Good. Has a nice ring to it. Erika, are you listening? We've decided to stick together from now on. First, we're carrying Hideyoshi's corpse to the parlor. Can you hold off playing detective until we get there? <laughs> when she heard the words playing detective, Erica grimaced visibly. Then, everyone stumbled out, and she took a single step into the now-empty guest room, looked around, and burned that scene into her eyes. Erica claimed to have a photographic memory that doesn't exist. <laughs> so Erica doesn't. <laughs> if that were tr was true, those few seconds were more than enough for her. Later on, she could sip black tea in the parlor while perusing the photograph of the scene inside her memory. Playing the part of an armchair detective. 
Then suddenly her eyes stopped on the closet off to the side. Uh-oh. A closet for hanging overcoats. If it was large enough to fit a coat on a hanger, a person should be able to hide in it. Slowly, Erica. Stretched her hand out towards the closet. Oh boy. Oh. Erica's shoulder was grabbed roughly from behind. Let's go, Miss Detective. Didn't you ever learn how to stick together on school field trips? Well, whenever I go traveling, someone always dies. Well then. That explains how fucked you are. Hey, what do you think you're doing, brats? Come quickly. I'd assume that was Eva. Oh, that was Rudolph. <coughs> I had a frog in my throat. <laughs> hurry up. Rudolph told them to hurry. After clicking her tongue and growing at the closet, Erica followed Batwer back to the parlor for the time being. Huh. Well, that's something. The sound of their footsteps finally faded. That time of terror, when I feared that even the dripping of the cold sweat covering my cheeks might be noticed, had finally ended. Okay. Um, this might be a somewhat awkward place to end this episode, but I'm going to end this episode here. So if you like this episode, well, I should say this first. That's going to be it for this episode, guys. If you liked it, be sure to press the like button. And if you didn't like it, fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye!